The Bronte sisters were the original Riot Girls. Prove me wrong. Hello and welcome to Flyover Culture, your guided tour of pop culture in the Midwest. I'm Peyton Whaley. Before we get started, don't forget to hit that subscribe button so you don't miss new episodes. Zines are just one of those things that defy explanation, like postmodernism or Tom Hanks' accent in Elvis. Why? Give me your definition of a zine and you'd probably be right. And also wrong, but also right. Zines can be just about whatever the heck you want. But there are some loose guidelines. To me, a zine is a self-published magazine. And um, that, that's very wide ranging. That's wide ranging on purpose. I think zines can be a lot of things. I kind of consider zines anything that is self-published that people make and distribute on a small scale. That's Mark Merman and Kathleen Paquette, two artists originally from the Bloomington area who got their start working on zines. They agreed to help me out on this exploration of the zine scene. Like they said, zines tend to be small press printings of booklets or little magazines that can be filled with anything from prose to poetry, comics to collage, photography to, I don't know, a step-by-step -step guide to changing your oil. As Mental Floss puts it, the most important aspect of a zine is generally that the publication identifies as one. While not totally necessary, another big part of zines is that they're tactile. There's excitement that comes from getting something made by an artist's hands into your own grubby little mitts. Zines have a long history of being passed around at conventions, shows, you name it. Well, zines have something of a long history in general. Zines as we know them now go back to the fanzines of the 1930s. One of, if not the earliest, was The Comet, a sci-fi zine made by the Science Correspondence Club in Chicago. Science fiction had a big part to play in zine culture those early years, and in 1955, the first Hugo Award for Best Fanzine was given out to Fantasy Times. The nature of zines has long allowed for people on the margins to express themselves without going through a publisher. That's why the first queer zine goes all the way back to 1947, in the form of Vice Versa by Edith Ide. She published under the pen name Lisa Ben, three guesses what that's an anagram for, for much of the 20th century, zines were made with mimeographs, also called stencil duplicators. But that was thrown out the window once Xerox copiers were introduced in 1949. Now you tell me, is that cheap or thrifty? And thanks to copy shops like Kinko's in the 1970s, zines saw another big boom around the time it pivoted to the punk scene in big cities like London, LA, and New York City. A lot of that do-it-yourself punk ethos still persists in zines to this day. Punk is very, has very much like by nature been like DIY. When punk came out, it wasn't long before re record labels pronounced it dead. And, you know, people were just like, okay, if, if, you know, if record companies don't want to put out our records, we'll just put them out themselves. If like big venues don't want to put on our shows, we'll just put them on ourselves. Zines would see another big surge in the 90s, thanks in large part to the Riot Girl scene, an underground feminist punk movement. This movement was huge for zines. According to Flavor Wire, by 1993, there were roughly 40,000 zines being published in North America that were dedicated to Riot Girl music and politics. And that brings us to now. Zines might not be as visible as they were in the 90s and the aughts, but they definitely never went away. Check your local bookshop, comic shop, record store, you'll likely find something good. A quick aside, earlier this year we got a fun wrinkle to this. The New York Times reported that a miniature book made by Charlotte Bronte, the last of the over two dozen that she made, resurfaced and went up for sale for $1.25 million. Is this book of poems the first zine? Read that first page and tell me it's not. Sold by nobody and printed by herself. The Bronte sisters' connection to punk music is so much deeper than we first thought. There have been countless artists and writers who got their starts in zines. Art Spiegelman, Robert Crumb, Aaron Toby, and hey, we know that guy. So I wanted to ask Kathleen and Mark how making zines has influenced their work now. Kathleen is a student who also works in youth mentorship and Mark is the photo editor at Mother Jones. And yes, he still makes zines on the side. Now I work with Girls Rock and with Girls Trans and Non-Binary non Youth in Music Mentorship. And I think that's that's something that, that definitely like dovetails with that kind of work too, because you know, when you're dealing with girls, women, queer folks, people of color, you name any marginalized like population and to just re constantly share, share and remind people that you don't have to wait for someone else's permission to speak. That's the most important thing I took away from that whole community. And that just like informs everything. You know, I decided to go to journalism school because I did a zine, you know, somebody I went to grad school with 
worked at Mother Jones and kind of helped me get the job there. And so it's, it's all like this nugget from doing zines that like, I knew I wanted to do something in publishing. I didn't know what. You're always picking up pointers from people and I still am, you know, like new ways of doing stuff. You know, I'm working on a zine now that there's a specific way I want to get it printed. So I'm reaching out to people to try and figure out how to do that without breaking the bank. But it's not just the material work. Zines have always provided a rallying point for communities of creators, whether that's at a brightly lit convention hall or a punk show in someone's basement. I toured for years and every town I went to when I would meet people and like trade zines and stuff, it's like, you know, most people have like photo albums of the things they did, they did in their, you know, teens and 20s. And I have a trunk of written documentation of like what all these people's lives were like. Like I have so much more than just snap snapshots. I have like essays and poetry and like all of these things that people made and wrote. Becoming pen pals with people was like a really big part of it too. So, you know, I would pick up zines sometimes and even if I didn't meet the person face to face, uh, if something in it resonated with me, I would just write to people and same with my zine. Um, so I ended up with pen pals like all over the country, all over the world. You read somebody's zine and um, you do get an idea of who they are. You get an idea of the music they like. You get an idea of kind of, you know, what makes them excited, what bums them out. You know, when you're making a zine and writing that stuff and presenting that stuff, it's very much, you know, outward facing, you know, all, in a way, sort of performative version of yourself. Whereas when you're writing a letter, it's more one on one and personal. And then, of course, when you meet in person, finally, you see how tall they are. You know, you see that they, you know, smell like a dirty sock or that, you know, they're like really funny in person where they're writing their zine writings more serious. It was just this tangible thing tangible but really ephemeral because they were just like different everywhere and they would just float around and most of them would just end up in the trash but then like lasting things would come out of that being like relationships with people or the trunk of stuff i hoarded and kept under my bed until a museum wanted it <laughs> so are we going to see another big resurgence in zines that's up to the people who want to make them people who've grown up you know they were born when the internet was around they don't know anything different and so a zine is is like a new experience like something that's like printed and tactile in the same way that you know for a lot of people you know the first time they experience a record just because it's it's a different experience and so i think it's it's very similar where it's what makes zines i think still last is the same thing that is is kind of a what's helping with the vinyl resurgence and that's the experience you know the, the actual physical tactile experience with with it the barrier of entry for zines could not be lower. So I asked Kathleen and Mark what advice they had. Just let your voice be your voice. And you know, if it resonates with someone great, but it also doesn't have to, you're gonna have to find your balance between like the self-consciousness in it. What you're willing to put out into the world versus like what's your, what's your authentic voice and like, how do you navigate that? I mean, I think that just goes for like any creative endeavor. Or put more bluntly, other people might think it sucks, but who cares? You know, just do it. You know, it's you'll learn from your mistakes and it's fun. As long as you're having fun, it doesn't matter. You know, that's that's all that really matters. A big thank you to Mark Merman and Kathleen Paquette for talking zines with me. And a special thanks to Hillary Fleck at the Monroe County History Center for putting me in touch. This whole episode got started because of a zine exhibition the center is putting on right now. So if you're in the area, please go check out the exhibit. It runs through the end of October. I'll have a link to more info on that down below. And please subscribe to Flavor Culture so you don't miss new episodes. Our season finale is up next, and it's going to be a fun one. See you next time.